were looking at abuse and faith-based organizations and questions related to that. Um, now we're going to lock, uh, really focus in on the impact that abuse has. has. And we have a, another panel, uh, an entirely different panel, and uh, we'd like to know who you are, um, ever so briefly, our, our, our time is, is uh, just marching right by. People are telling me that left, right, and center. So, so here we are together to say who you are and um, what your area of expertise or education or specialty is, and then we'll jump right in. David Sablachik, I teach in the seminary, and I'm a social worker dude. A social worker dude? Okay. Uh, Beverly Sablachik, I am a counselor and I also teach part-time in the seminary. Are you guys married, connected in some way? Yes, a little bit. So he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a counselor, well, a social worker dude, and you're a, a counselor do that. I'm a do that. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, Scott Ward, and I'm an assistant professor of discipleship and religious education in the seminary. I'm not a clinical expert, uh, but I survived a very long uh, relationship and in the midst of that learned to cling to God. And so I help people to discover ways to devotionally connect and to survive uh, difficult times through, through spirituality. I'm Michaela Evers. I was Mrs. America in 2018 and Miss Indiana USA in 2014. I am an advocate. I've been spending my entire brains advocating um, as, a, as a survivor and someone who has uh, continued to, to heal that process and help others do the same thing. I'm Sarah McDougall, and I am an author, speaker, and abuse recovery coach, um, an alum of Andrews University for my graduate work here. So it's great to be back, and I work exclusively with women who are surviving and recovering from abusive relationships, abusive marriages, um, and and that's kind of what I do full time now. I'm also a mom, which is kind of important. Which is also what you do full time. Which I also do full time. Yes, yes, I do. My name is Chris Silver. I'm a dad too, single dad even. Um, I am a filmmaker. I produce uh, TV and film out of Los Angeles, also overseas. I am an advocate as a survivor of abuse, of sexual abuse as a child. I am an advocate working especially for teenagers all over the world. I've been very instrumental in getting kids off the street and protecting them from, from violence um, in Africa, South America, and the United States. And I have, in my industry, been one of the people that were instrumental in launching the Me Too movement. I'm Dr. Judy Fisher. I am a psychologist. I serve as Director of Counseling and Psych Services here at Andrews University. Worked with college students and also in the community um, in a private practice. I have worked with um, individuals for a number of years and with um, both abusers and individuals who are trying to change and want to become healthier people. Well, thank you all for joining us. Our first question as it pertains to the impact of abuse is, what can parents do to minimize the danger of their children being abused? What can parents do to minimize the danger of their children being abused? I think one thing, and I am not a mother yet actively praying, uh, so I appreciate the prayers as well from you all. Um, <laughs> One thing that I've noticed, I was abused, sexually molested by my mom and dad's cocaine dealer when I was eight. And the one thing that I've now recognized just this past year as a 29 year old, um, the importance of knowing the signs of being groomed. And that is a really, really important thing because we have adults in and out of our lives, coaches, other leaders that our kids are constantly being um, influenced by, and sometimes it's hard to see that fine line about what grooming really is. And I have another friend in the pageant industry that has just experienced this this past year. And the hard part about grooming is that, and some of you might know more than I, but it's a fine line. It's, it's nothing, nobody's actually broken a law yet. But if someone is seeking your child out, giving them gifts, texting them, messaging them, actively making them feel special, it could be a coach that is seeking out on the team, that is the, the, the first signs that abuse may happen. And I think in know, excuse me, knowing 
what to look for there. And then my other advice is I think something that I'm working on hopefully being a mother soon, is being very open to that conversation. I was raised by my grandmother, where everything was swept under the rug, where I think we need to speak with our children and be open about that conversation, even if it is uncomfortable. One of the things that, uh, that I would say is parents need to get as healthy as they can get for themselves. If I get healthier, I'm going to be able to help my children be protected, be healthy for themselves. So, my modeling is important. One of the things I think that's a danger though is sometimes as parents, we can fall into over controlling. If we've had a history of abuse ourselves, that can be just as harmful as not controlling. So I think the educated you know, is going to be really important. I'd like to add in addition to that, um, it is true that someone may not be the direct recipient of abuse, but indirectly this person can be abused as well. So if for example, the children are in the home, or they may not even seem to be aware of it, but they certainly are, and a parent is abusing the other one, the child is also being abused. Even though the child is not being hit, the child may not be the direct recipient of that emotional abuse. That child is being abused. So if parents want to protect their children, they have to make sure that they're not abused as well. Because if they are and the children are aware of it, definitely the children one quick thing I want to add, as a mother, I have two children, and we often want to, we have this, uh, I'm, I'm going to use some strong words here, but I think we have this archaic sense of what it means to preserve a child's innocence in many ways, and, and, and a lot of times that means that we don't actually talk as parents in a healthy way to our children about sexuality, about their bodies, about other people who do not have good intentions for their sexuality and their bodies until we think they are old enough to handle that information. And that is one of the big things that can allow them to have experienced things that they do not have the vocabulary to discuss. Right. So if we as parents want to help prevent our children from experiencing abuse or from experiencing ongoing abuse, we cannot completely isolate them from the world. We can't protect them from experiencing everything, but we can talk to them from a very young age to a very age appropriate and gradual increasing in their knowledge. You can teach them the real names for things with their bodies. You can teach them that the certain types of touch in certain places are never okay. And you teach them to tell you everything. Now that requires having an open, healthy, transparent relationship where you talk to your kids about all kinds of stuff. And I, I actually do videos and have blog posts on books that you can use to speak to your children if you're really awkward and don't know how to get those conversations going. And there are great books available for as young as three years old to start talking to your kids in age-appropriate, healthy ways so that if something ever does happen to them, you have preempted that with tools for them to be able to explain what's going on instead of leaving them in the dark, knowing it's wrong, and having no way to share it. One thing I'd like to add as a dad, the fact that you're having children does not mean that you're qualified <laughs> to communicate with your children everything that could come up. What I'm talking about is trauma. There are situations, traumatic situations. Abuse is definitely one of them. Um, loss of a loved one can be another one that require qualified help. As a parent, don't be too you know, magnanimous in your view of, of, of your own abilities or of some magical way that you're just being, that, that those gifts are bestowed upon you. Uh, go and seek counseling, even if you have a little hunch of something that's traumatizing for your child. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to real quickly say, oh, you, you mentioned, Sarah, about, uh, you know, talk about everything with your children. That means that in that everything, you have to be willing to hear it and not yes. react and yes. overreact. Yes. I'm willing to hear, oh, you had your first kiss. Oh, you had your first beer. Oh, you did that. Okay, well, I'm glad we we're able to talk about it. You made your first mistake. I'm glad that you were able to talk about it. You know, to be able to really talk about it and, you know, and not have a hissy fit. Oh, you're never going out with this person again or you're never going to do this again. But be able to talk about it and help that child to learn from that experience. And so that really is important, that, that uh, the 
ability to talk with them and to be able to hear and not have a hissy fit when they tell you. If you, if you, can't, mm -hmm. if you can't talk about that stuff, they will never tell you about bigger stuff. Talk about that stuff in a calm, cool, if you, collective If you can't way. talk about it first, no, and yes, yes. Then first other kinds of things, if, you, if your child can't come to you with their first crush and talk about it without you shutting it down, if you, and, and you may not agree, and you may express that you do not agree, but you can do it in a way that doesn't shame them and shut them down, and you can say, I'm so glad we, you came and told me, I love hearing what's in your mind and in your heart, and now here, let's talk about what, you know, let's talk about that. You can avoid the hissy fit, and you can do tricky stuff. <laughs> no. Like you can go out in the no. parking lot, no. you go out into the driveway and you can tell that boy that's sitting in the car waiting for your daughter, she doesn't live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she hates you, she no. told me. No. Uh, See, you're uh, you're uh, 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 no. See here, wait, wait a second. Here, this is something that ties in with this question. Stranger danger is this myth from like the 70s and 80s. Stop telling your kids that all the people dangerous are strangers. Just yeah. that guy in the driveway. Well, but he's not a stranger anymore, he wouldn't be there. Yeah. I got rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> but see, it, what we teach our children is tricky people. Right. So how do you then address that as it pertains to family members? That is a tricky situation. I'm going to let somebody else hold the mic because we're talking about it. <laughs> Again, if I have this relationship, remember, there's grooming that goes on even in the family. Mm -hmm. It's not just out there. The grooming can happen even within the family. And so if I have this kind of relationship where my children and I are talking about everything and they're telling me, Mommy, I'm uncomfortable or I'm picking up this discomfort. Boy, when we get over to Grandma's house, you get really quiet and you're not playing and you get really clingy. Uh, you, know, I, I'm, you know, is there something that I need to know? And be able to talk about it and then, then they will be able to tell you, I just don't feel right. And I, my daughter-in-law teaches has taught my, my grandchildren to pay attention to how you feel. If you're uncomfortable, I don't care who it is, if you're uncomfortable, please, let's talk about it, rather than let's pretend that it's okay. And then, I don't care if it's auntie or uncle, uncle buddy or whoever it is, I want you to be able to talk about it. And, and you know, you have that gut feeling, you need to respect that. That really is very important. And so teaching our children to, you know, pay attention to what they're feeling and if I have this kind of open and honest relationship, remember uh, perpetrators are going to pick kids who are vulnerable mm -hmm. and they are alone, they're isolated, their needs are not met. It won't be my child because I'm talking to my child. <laughs> That's right. Okay, okay, one more thing with that. This is, this is really, really, I'm sorry, Dr. Fisher. No, go ahead. You had a number to finish on this now. Your child doesn't say, I have anxiety. Your child says, my tummy hurts. Your child doesn't say, I think this person is unsafe. Your child says, mommy, don't make me hug them. You have to listen to your child's cues. You have to pay attention when they are telling you things are not okay. Because a kid isn't going to be able to have all that big terminology. And honestly, probably most of us don't either. We got it after the fact. Mm -hmm. right. So one of the things, practical take home, one of the things I've done with my kids is I ask them from like age four or five, when you know something is wrong, where do you feel it? Because we all feel it in a different place. Right? Some of you feel like you need to go to the bathroom. Some of you get your throat tightened up. Some of you feel this pounding in the back of your head. Some of you, your heart races. Some of you, your hands start shaking. Everybody has a, a fight or flight, an adrenaline sense, a gut instinct response, and not all of us are the same. But if you teach your child, what do you feel when, you're, when you just know something's not right? And if you're a Christian, you say, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Don't ever ignore that instinct. And then you talk to them, well, your sister feels it this way, you feel it that way, listen to that. That is God talking to your body. And then, when you are out somewhere, and they feel uncomfortable, and you have assessed the situation, this has happened to us. We're at an ice cream shop, somebody comes in, my son's uncomfortable. He says, Mommy, I think we should go now. I look over there, I can assess the situation, there's absolutely no threat or danger. But my son feels uncomfortable. And my son is a child that I have been teaching to listen to 
his instincts. So you know what we did? We packed up our ice cream and we left. Were we in danger? No. But he needed to see that. Mommy says, you listen when your gut tells you something. Paying attention to our kids is extremely important because what happens to them during those formative years lasts an entire life. Entire life. You know, quite often I have people who come in to me and they're 40 and 50 and 60 year olds and they're dealing with abuse that took place when they were five and six or four and three. And sometimes they have no recollection of what really took. They knew something went wrong. And so we have to pay attention to the children. We have to pay attention to how they feel and what they tell us and get to understand them because we are put in this world to protect them. This is our role as adults. There are a couple more things I just want to add very quickly. Um, these are types of emotional abuse that people don't think about most of the time. Um, there's one that's called emotional abuse of enmeshment. This usually happens in families of creation. This is where you have parents who tend to be abusive or caretakers who tend to be abusive. They want control. And so the child has no privacy. The child grows up in a place where he or she is no longer able to access his or her own self. When your child is very small, no matter how old, they need to know that they are unique, that they have boundaries. So in those homes, there are no boundaries or there are few boundaries. And so the child grows up, it's really group think, is I can't think for myself. As the child gets to be older, he or she tends to gravitate towards you know, individuals who will continue the abuse. Another type is also abuse of overprotection and indulgence. This is when parents tend to be totally overprotective. Now, I'm a parent, and we all want to protect our kids. We're talking about issues where there is a certain amount of control. There's a certain amount of power that comes from rescuing the child over and over and over again, and what do you think happens? This child becomes crippled, cannot function, and no matter what, even when they get to go to college and become adults, they can't function on their own. They can't, I've known people who can't make a decision on their own, because someone else makes the decision for them. And this is abusive, because what happens is that we're keeping these individuals from growing up to become autonomous, independent adults as God wants them to be. I want one more just quick comment. There's been some really good research recently um, in, in families where there's been domestic violence. When they look at children who are five, six, seven, eight, compared to infants, the infants, the infants are the one, <laughs> ones that are more severely damaged because their brains are being wired then by the, the, the abuse going on in the home than even a five or six year old who has some ability to cope with it. So be, 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 be careful, the infants are the ones that later on will manifest more severe symptoms. Understanding that children are extremely vulnerable, how can we show vulnerable people in general how to avoid becoming abuse victims without victim blaming? How can we show vulnerable people how to avoid becoming abuse victims without victim blaming? If somebody, in other words, has a tendency that you're maybe noticing or, or somebody feels vulnerable or they might be inclined to allow someone else to have control of them, how can somebody build themselves up so that they have barriers against becoming um, victims of abuse? Two, two things. One, place the responsibility for abuse where it belongs, and that is on the shoulders of the abuser. Mm -hmm. That's how you avoid the victim blaming part. Mm -hmm. so, so that isn't blaming, you're not blaming. I mean, if not, that person is, is doing wrong, if you're being abused, it's not blaming to say, you're abusing me. Not at all. That's not blaming. No, that's, no. But, but the second thing is to help victims understand that they also have a responsibility for their personal agency. Now, I'm speaking of adult, adults here. I, I, it, gets, it gets trickier when you're talking about minors. But an adult victim, it's someone who continues to choose abusers. Is that what you're kind of talking about? Someone who, who, keeps, who keeps falling into abusive relationships <laughs> uh, needs to, I would say, seek counseling because they need 
to be taken through the steps of rediscovering or perhaps discovering for the first time their personal autonomy, their personal agency in order to rewire how they think and what they're attracted to. And that means that they have to discover the beauty of the identity God created them to have as who he sees them in his heart. Is there something to be said for broadening your community so that somebody doesn't have exclusive access to you and the only voice that you're hearing is theirs? I mean, a healthy church life, for example, where you're plugged into a community of believers, um, that would be a way to insulate yourself. Um, you're hearing more, you're listening to more people. Well, one thing I think that, that's important to understand, building on what you said, Sarah, is that most people who are victims of abuse have a shame-based thought process about themselves. I'm no good, I don't deserve any better, I've been treated this way all my life, I guess I deserve to be treated this way again. And a part of their growing into agency is to challenge those false beliefs that they have about themselves, um, that, that I am precious. You know, in other words, am I going to believe all the voices I've heard before, or am I going to believe what God says about me? Am I going to internalize the truth as opposed to all these lies that I've heard in the past about myself? Yes, and reprogramming the things we believe about ourselves is not something that happens in a miraculous, great moment of hearing a great sermon or something like that. It is work. It takes a lot of work. Just as we've already heard, it takes a long time for an abuser to change their mindset, if that's going to happen at all. Um, so coming from a healthy church environment, I think what's so important for our churches is to define what healthy really means and to not automatically, as we've just heard the numbers, so let's be honest folks, the church is one of the greatest, one of the easiest places to get abused or get away from God. So in that, so you know, you know the numbers about how many young people leave. There's a reason for that. So knowing that, not automatically saying that church is a healthy place, but realizing that we have work to do as believers, as followers, to create a healthy church. And just in response to the way you restated the question, uh, maybe just very simple and practical way with my own children, um, being in a very much divided home with an abusive mother and with me there, it is very important to me to have worship and prayer with each of my kids individually every night as I put them to bed and tell them that God loves them and that I love them and I'm proud of them. And when you build that sense of self-esteem and the expectation that this is the reality that God wants for them, they will see abuse as a very foreign thing. There's no doubt about this. When it comes to abuse, if we're talking about manipulation, power, coercion, and what that does, it literally tears the person down to the core. If it happened during the early years of life, when we're talking about formative years, this person's development is arrested. So we're talking, when they come to counseling later on, we're dealing with individuals who maybe they look like they're 20 year olds or they're functioning as a 20 year old, but their inner child is pretty much down to a five or six or seven or whatever that um, abuse took place. So we're talking about a process, a process of rebuilding the core self, and it takes a long time. Definitely it takes not just the individual, but in others who come in as support, whether it is a church, whether it is a community, because more than likely this person cannot do it alone. One of the things that abuse does is gets you to a place where you feel like you are helpless. You can't do it by yourself. And that's the reason for which most of the time, if it is in a marital relationship, the person who is being abused will more than likely not leave on his or her own. They don't have the energy to do it anymore. So that's the reason for which we need to have communities of individuals who are educated, who can come in and help. Definitely not make decisions for this person because this person needs to learn to make those decisions. However, to be a support because the process is a lengthy process and it's one of rebuilding the core self, rebuilding the sense of self-worth, the esteem, the confidence, coming to a place where this person can finally say, I am a child of God. I am autonomous. I can make decisions on my own. I can be who I am. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time. Dr. Fisher, um, that is a very, very good segue into 
a connected question that we have here, and that is, um, what therapies are most helpful and, and work best for treating post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, somebody has endured abuse, they've come to the realization that, you know, I've, I've undergone something traumatic and it's affecting my life. What steps should they take and what kinds of therapy should they engage in? Connected with that is, are you familiar with the, the ACE um, study or what is that? It's a test. You take, you answer ten questions. The adverse childhood experience. Um, yes. Is that legit? And is that? Well, it is definitely. It is a study, and it literally lets us know something that makes a lot of sense. That the things that occurred to us in those early years, during those formative years, impact us for the rest of our lives. And so we do realize that even even if someone experiences emotional abuse, again, we touched on this earlier. This is where there are no outward signs. A um, person doesn't come out with a bruise or anything of that nature, but emotional abuse is most pervasive. It takes place not just with sexual abuse or physical abuse or financial abuse, it takes place on its own as well. So it's everywhere. And so we're talking about individuals who come to a place where they no longer feel that they can think on their own. And many times people either, they take a flight, they, they freeze, they dissociate so that they can numb themselves to a place where they can tolerate what is going on for them. So there are lots of different approaches to help individuals get back to a place of healing. Different connections or different um, combinations of therapies. One that seems to be very effective has to do with helping people to change their minds up. We're talking about cognitive behavior therapy. Right? Now we have all heard about the plasticity of the brain and, and, and I am amazed at what God has created in our head, in our system, in our brain. This is where there are neural passages and pathways that are created in our brain. And the same pathways that allow us to come to a place where we question ourselves, where we no longer think that we can. For example, somebody mentioned earlier about um, one of those emotional ways of um, abusing is denial, um, and, and the common term is gaslighting. This is where an abuser tells the abused that what took place didn't actually take place. It's all in your head. You didn't think of it that way. No, it's not that way. So just imagine someone experiencing this for a month, two months, two years, 10 years, 15 years or more. After all, this is from someone whom they trust or whom they're supposed to trust. So eventually, the, the, the thought processes become very distorted. So CBT helps in helping people to reconfigure those neural pathways, to reconfigure the thought processes, to help you slowly, gradually, and eventually get to a place where you can refute those negative thoughts, where you can embrace positive thoughts and thoughts that help you to come to a place where you can ultimately accept the fact that you're human, you're an adult, you're autonomous, you're capable of doing those things that this person did not think or did not want to let you think that you could do. So CBT is one of those. Of course, it has to be coupled with um, other types of therapeutic modalities that help people to feel safe, that help them to feel empowered, because of course the abuse takes away your power, it strips you of your power, so it's empowerment. Um, another type of um, uh, approach is, and I love positive psychology, that helps people to look at their strengths, because no matter how helpless someone happens to be, I, as a therapist, I want to find where are your strengths. And even if you've been beaten to the core, you still have strength. So I'm gonna to try to find those, and that's gonna be my business to find those. Because I believe that once I find those, I'm gonna put a spark. And I'm gonna get you to begin to grow that. And as it grows, it grows, and then you can begin to think of other strengths that you have, and eventually come to a place where you realize, hey, I can, I will. I must, I owe it to myself or to my, myself and my kids and to the world to live as God wants me to live. So it is possible and there are ways to make it happen. So there is hope. Yes. Yes. And just to piggyback on what I just, 
I'm standing here is really nothing more I can add except I would like to say that community is important. Mm -hmm. You can't do it by yourself. You didn't get hurt by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so community is important. Having a core group of people who know you and you can begin to develop this trust and they can help you and support you. This is, we were never intended to be on this journey alone. And so we are designed to be in community. And so this, there's no, if you don't go, I'm not going, don't hinder me. Eh, wrong answer. God included, he wanted us to be in community. Community is his idea. And so that's very, very important. And I just would like to really emphasize, it takes time. Um, I can tell you that a number of people don't darken our door in, in counseling because we don't want it to be time consuming. We want it to be quick and easy. I've had people say, well, I've been coming to you for six months, that should be enough. Well, it's not. We've been, uh, you know, we've been in counseling for years and we're still learning about ourselves and, you know, try, oh man, I'm still struggling with this. Another layer of the onion has been pulled back. And so it does take time, especially when the wounding has taken place in the formative years. I'd like to quickly make a comment too. One of the, one of the therapies for trauma that is gaining a lot of recognition these days is called EMDR, Eye Movement Response Desensitization. And, and again, that seems to help some reprogram the brain more quickly some, from some of the trauma damage that's been done there. Another comment I'd like to make is trauma, in whatever form the abuse took, is an experience. Therefore, I like to prefer experiential treatments rather than simply cognitive ones. Yeah. Cognitive ones deal with the left brain, you know, which is our logical, linear self, but experiential ones deal with the right brain, which is more the creative, where trauma is really lodged a lot is more in the right brain, and so I like experiential kinds of things. Can you give of what, what, yeah. what that would Yeah, yeah. Like? from a Christian point of view, you know, one of the things I like to, to invite people to do is, is ask this question, you know, when you were hurt, where was Jesus? Okay, where was, where was he? Was he there, wasn't he there? Now we know, for example, from the word that in all of our afflictions, he was afflicted. In all of our sufferings, he suffered. We also know that he himself was abused physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually, in every way you can imagine, he was abused. So we have someone who knows, not just cognitively, but who knows experientially what our experience was. And how can I connect people to that experience of Jesus and have Jesus connect to my experience. And so we sometimes do that through a visualization of, of Jesus and our experience, inviting, you know, again, in, in the context of safety and what that person is willing to allow. Again, it's a journey that takes time. It's not a magical cure, but experience. Thank you, sweetheart. It's, experience is something. You really like her, don't you? Oh, I know. <laughs> but, but an experiential experience like that, from a Christian point of view, for us, I think, can be very effective. I, I've known it to be. Dr. Vanderkolk in The Body Keeps the Score yes. builds this yeah. incredible case mm -hmm. for the idea that, and this is a, almost word for word from the book, he says that trauma almost invariably involves not being seen or heard or taken into account. Right. And so it would seem that healing would involve being seen, heard, and taken into account by God, by God, and others. And, and others. I'm going to say that one of the most effective things that I have found in a not in a, in a formal counseling thing, but sharing things that work from person to person, has been taking passages of Scripture, rewriting them in the first person. Passages where God tells you what He thinks of you. Where he tells you that you are precious, where he tells you that you are loved, and then and then listening to them when you can't sleep at night, listening to them when you are struggling to fall asleep, listening to them when you are feeling discouraged or down. And I've actually done a series of these recordings for the women that I have in peer support groups, and I've had some of them say, I, I think hundreds of the views on those because I put them on YouTube and stuff are from me listening to them every single night. What I found was extremely effective for me 
was for me to put those scripture passages in first person. And while it's nice to listen to someone else's voice, but to record them in my own voice. Because there's this sense that my own voice is speaking inside my own head. And as I'm falling asleep, I'm hearing myself in my own head telling me what God says about me. Mm. And that can be very nurturing, especially if you're combining it with a number of other forms of therapies to remind you in an experiential way of what God says about who you are. I may have totally made this up, this therapy, all by myself, for myself. For the first few years of my marriage, I couldn't go to sleep unless I were to go through a process of looking in the closet, under the bed, in the bathroom, behind the shower curtain, and then lock the door so I knew I was locked inside of the bedroom. Then I could be calm enough to fall asleep. Um, and of course, my wife thought it was absolutely insane and she couldn't understand it. Um, but if I got in bed and forgot to move through that process, there's no way I'm falling asleep. I have to get up, look in the closet, look under the bed, look in, lock the door, then I can fall asleep. And I think that the thing that helped me more than anything else, I, I'd be curious if you could comment on this, was writing. Writing out my thoughts and feelings and telling myself things through a creative process of um, fine-tuning my, my thinking and my feeling in the form of words on paper. Is that a yeah, it is. legit therapy? Definitely so. Journaling is definitely part of the therapeutic process. In addition to that, art therapy, music therapy, especially for children and adolescents. Is Bob Dylan okay, or does it have to be? <laughs> I think he healed me. I'm honest. I'm just Some, telling you. Sunset, yeah. I mean, I'm It's amazing what it does for you, especially if you're in a place where you can't find your thoughts. And there are times when, depending on the trauma, or depending on where you're developmental, you may not be able to be able to think through and to work through. But it's amazing how just playing with something, um, having sand therapy, paint therapy, coloring, all of these things, um, therapists use a lot of different modalities to literally get to people's core, their heart, when they're dealing with trauma. And those are most effective. From a pastoral perspective, in the, in the light of devotions, um, what I would do is I developed many different devotional practices. And I actually had a chapel, a little chapel, um, where I worked at the academy. And so after, you know, in the mornings, it could be just total chaos, getting the kids to school, or even before going home to face uh, what was going on at home again. Um, just sitting in there and just resting in God's presence. You can you can take a nap with God. Just intentionally, I'm with you. You be praying and just and just drift. It doesn't have to be very active and, and worship music and just reciting scripture, memorizing scripture, claiming those promises. But just a place of calm, a place of stillness and safety, uh, deliberately in the presence of God. We're talking about a lot of things that we're doing on our own, and that's beautiful. Um, however, I would also like to add that one of the main reasons we have church is that we need other people. We need to see God in other people. We need to be seen by others. I believe, and I'm a strong advocate for that, that we need to, and I'm really going to use the strong language of need to, transform church into an academy of connection an academy of emotional intelligence. What I mean is, let, use, you have human beings right there with you. Any of these persons has, if you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, who can you know, make light happen with one word, has the ability to give you the fullness of God's presence and that connection. So as we practice church community, how can we reform the way that we fellowship with one another so that we go deep, we, we go for the deeper cut, we share deeply, we go, we ask again, are you really okay? Someone told me today, and I know that Sarah Kelly told me today, and, and I happen to know uh, the, the person she was talking about, which is uh, Pastor Rick Warren, who has this amazing ability of always going to someone saying, are you really okay? Are things really fine? Or asking myself, checking for myself, I said this yesterday as we wrapped up, Feedback, 
asking for feedback, not being too, too, too wrapped up in your ego, to go to someone else, anyone around you, and saying, hey, where can I do better? Where can I do better in my relationship? Where can, where can, where can I learn from you? Let's create that culture. And I'm telling you, we're doing a huge job for preventing cruising. At a very fundamental level, you said, how do we transform church into an academy of emotional intelligence? I'm going to rip that off so much. That is so good. So, but, but, but here's the thing. Doesn't church then have to be an open fellowship and a judgment-free zone? Doesn't it? I mean, if 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 you're being if you're being kept out at the door, not overtly, but with emotional cues of rejection and being marginalized, isn't that in itself a form of abuse? Well, yeah, of course, absolutely. <laughs> I know where you're coming from. <laughs> That's a smart question. Of course, it's abuse. Of course, it's abuse. To to, to any us versus them attitude is abuse. Absolutely. I'm getting in danger of preaching here. I'm an activist. Be careful with me. Any time that we buy into the narrative of this culture and this country, which is us versus them, everywhere on every level, poor versus rich, black versus white, you name it, all right? Male versus female. Anytime we do that in the church, we are abusing. That we are being abusive. And our only. job is to create a place where you are safe from any of that. Any of those stereotypes. Absolutely. Any of that discrimination. So we're speaking about people within the church, but many times when you are a victim of abuse, it alters your picture of God in a very deep and profound way. So one of the questions here is, where was God when I was being violated? Sometimes it's not even the people within the church. It's just your picture of God that has been so altered that it's hard for you to step into a space or even think that there is a community that can understand your hurt and pain. So I'm, I want to speak to this because I believe very strongly that we, well, when we're children, our parents and those we trust, they stand in for our picture of the character of God, right? Very much so, especially fathers. And there's no better way to tear down the next generation than to break their picture of God through fathers who are absent, abandoning, or abusive. Because then that child grows up and their picture of God is one who is absent, abandoning, and abusive. And instead of growing into a, an adult relationship where they view God as he is, as a God of love, as a God of, of, of a high standard of character, as a God who is a protector and a provider, they see him as a God who was like daddy, abandoning, absent, and abusive. So can God repair that? Absolutely. Does God use other people in the body of community to stand in and repair that? Absolutely. But when we ask, where was God when I was abused, when I was, when I was, when this happened to me? Well, that, that comes back to understanding that God is not responsible for the wickedness and evil in the world. There is a battle between good and between evil, and God's heart is for us. God's character is for us. God's love is for us, and yet we live on a sinful planet. And God's desire is never for us to have experienced whatever it was that broke us. But his power is capable of taking those ashes and turning them into beauty. Can I, I'm going to add to that really quick. I, first of all, I'm very unqualified. You guys keep going that way. I'm loving hearing from all of you. Just from a, from a, a survivor standpoint on that, it, it was a very long time for me to realize, actually, Heather Thompson Day, who's a professor here, um, she said this to me in one of our just chats once together, and um, me still building up the courage to share my story as someone who is a survivor moving into, um, or a, a, a victim moving into that role as a survivor, and I kept saying in, in the back of my mind, it's so easy as a society for people to tell you things happen for a reason, things happen for a reason. And that's what it is, no, no, and no. That's what I kept telling myself. And for me, for myself, I would say, you know, I truly believe that God let this happen to me so I could do this. And Heather stopped me in my track. She goes, girl, God did not do this. God did not allow this to happen. Come on. The devil is playing. That is the devil playing in your life. And that, I mean, 
mean, that just blew my mind. Liberating. Yes. But, but I think it's important. We're talking as adults. My, my four-year-old, my three-year-old, didn't know about the theology of God, and he said he would never leave me nor forsake me. The question in my heart as his three-year-old, where were you, God, when this was happening to me? I, as I grew up and, you know, became a, a, a Christian, it was like, well, I know he was there and, and all of that. But I, my three-year-old heart didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And so part of the question, even, uh, I, I give for me people permission to ask the question. You know, God is not put off by us asking this question. Yes. Where were you? Were you off superintending stars? Did you have something better to do besides tending to my needs when this was happening to me? And I believe, as David has suggested, that God is interested. He wants to tell you himself. He has a story to tell about your story. Mm -hmm. And so if you just pause and let him tell you his story about your story, it's transformational. Yeah. Oh, you were superintendent stars. You were right there with me. You didn't leave me. I, oh, you were. I can see you. You showed me right where you were. And then now I have the theology. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But then I also have the experience that he's never left me. And so this God who stands on yesterday, mm -hmm. like today, he can touch my yesterday. I'm uh -huh. sorry, I don't mean to get to preaching, yeah, yeah, yeah. but he can touch my yesterday, yeah, yeah, yeah. like today. Uh -huh. That's the good news of the gospel. And so, yes, we can hear the theology. Yes, you know, and he certainly, God was not doing these things for to us. But I need to know experientially, and he wants to teach me. His story about my story, and that is transformation. Amen. Amen. Our, our time is up. And that, that's we just good, got started. No, we did just get started. <laughs> we need to get you a congregation. <laughs> we do have one final question. Yes. Yeah, I just want to say this is really important, especially for us as Adventists. Um, when I grew up, our our teachings at church were all about the rules. Mm -hmm. and the behaviors and the lists and I had no concept of personal relationship with Jesus it took many years for my thinking and, and through experiences to come to that like you talked about in your sermon this morning the Bible is a narrative it's not to be all, all chopped up we need our doctrines but it's a narrative it's a story we can have relationship with God and he is a good God and when we know that it's about a relationship then we know that he is with us in the suffering he is there with us crying, and he does not like what's happening to us. We need to understand and communicate that it's about being with God, traveling through this life, being remade in his image, uh, much like what you talked about this morning. But he is with us in our suffering. He is crying. He relates to us, and he's not going to abandon us. Yeah, and I just want to say one more thing real quick, real quick, and then I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to say anything no, no. about the second right. one. The, you know, we, uh, in the previous panel, we were talking about divorce and God, you know, God hates divorce. But do you understand that this is the same God who hates shams of marriages? Amen. It, he, he hates shams of marriages as much as he hates divorce. And so I stayed for the children. No, you didn't. You, you know, the truth is you stayed because you were afraid or whatever reason. You can tell yourself, you know, that, that you can dance that way. But God hates shams of marriages. And so when people sit and say, well, I don't know if I should stay or leave. And, you know, he's not technically cheating. You know, he's just watching porn or he's just emotionally abusive. You know, we can do this dance that we're doing. But God hates the sham. We say our marriage and we're teaching our children the sham, the lie of marriage. He hates that justice. Okay, just one last question. This is a mundane, boring, practical question. Uh, we asked at the end of the last panel, we're going to ask again, do you have any resources? Anywhere you want to direct people? Websites? How do we get educated? How do we get tuned in? Books you want to recommend? Bob Dylan songs you want to recommend? Whatever. Go for it. Well, I'll just try by saying that if anyone here or within the sound of my voice is experiencing abuse, that there is hope. First of all, you need to know that. Yes. There are resources. If you're right here in Marion Springs or in the South of Michigan area, earlier we, we 
gave you some numbers that are in some places where you can go. Right here on the campus, there's a counseling center and it is in Bell Hall. And we have counselors, therapists, psychologists like myself, and other students uh, who are studying to become uh, psychologists and counselors who provide services for students and their spouses. So if you're a student, come in, don't wait, it is, and it is confidential. We follow state rules, we are an accredited agency, and we provide quality services. If you're part of the community, come in and see me anyway. There are resources right here in the community that you can access. There is hope, yes. and you need to continue to keep that in your heart because you were not meant to be abused. You were not meant to be to feel as though you were less than the creative being that God intended for you to be. So please access those resources. If you're on campus, whether you're a student or not, Counseling Center is in Bell Hall. Come in, see us, we will direct you to other places, we'll make referrals, or if you're a student, you will get help. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the way I survived my long-term abusive situation was through turning to God. I've written that up in book form, it's called Authentic, and I will be here tomorrow afternoon from two to five with a workshop, and I will be talking about that for three hours, experiencing it, and uh, book will be over Where there. exactly, in this room? Right here. Right here from? Two to two five, five, the afternoon seminar time frame. I'll be right here talking about devotional life to help you through difficult times. I also want to just throw out there, there are um, distance counseling for those who may not be on campus and easy to access or those who are watching online. And you can check that out at abidecounseling.us. Dot com, I'm sorry, abidecounseling.com, and that is a network of licensed counselors and trained coaches who are available for distance counseling and have specialties in these areas. Also, I write and publish on this, these topics and on surviving and healing, and you can find those at wildernesstowild.com or sarahmcdougall.com. Is that also where they find the bibliography that you mentioned earlier? You said yes, you have a list, list of books. I have, I have a long list of Best, Same best books to read, okay. and, and those are a list of books for parents who want to have conversations that are really scary about sex and porn and all these other things to start educating your kids. Oh, books will help you do that. And so age-appropriate lists of books, books to read if you want to become an advocate, books to read if you're recovering from an abusive situation. And they pretty much all start off with things like Lundy Bancroft's work and Don Hennessy and others. Um, and I also have, uh, if you connect with me on Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram, I have access to highly confidential peer support groups for women, this is my area of specialty, women who have experienced uh, abusive dating or marriage relationships, particularly those where there was a sexual addiction component with the spouse or porn addiction component with the spouse, and for young women or mature women who were raised by highly abusive parents and those are peer support groups that come at absolutely no charge, and there are a ton of resources available inside those groups, as well as connecting with others who've walked a similar road so that you have that authentic community. Other resources, books, anything anyone would like to recommend? For, uh, for pastors who have been hurt, there's a great book by Terry Wardle called Wounded. And it's it's a, a great book about his own journey of healing. There's also another book uh, that I'm very familiar with called Cleansing the Sanctuary of the Heart, yeah. Tools for Emotional Healing. Some of you may have heard of it. Did you write that? Because of all your body language. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you co-author that book? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for um, being a prophetic voice in a, a generation that desperately needs um, moral clarity. Um, thank you for having a legitimate outrage against uh, abuse. Um, thank you for having hearts that are um, passionate in getting yourselves to the place where you could be of use to God and, and to his people. You're, you're educated. You've thought these things through. You've felt feelings and you, you've thought in patterns of thinking that you've somehow been able to pull together and, and to deliver to us here this afternoon, and we are blessed. We are blessed by pastors and evangelists, as we just commonly understand. We're blessed by people like you who are doing ministry uh, on a level that we don't acknowledge and recognize, and uh, thank you for making yourselves available to 
to the body of Christ and ministering to us.